Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to the organizers. It's great to be here. Uh, let's just jump right in, uh, make sure I know how to uh, advance slides. Good. I want to pause on this slide for a second. I actually want to start out with a question for all of you and a show of, show of hands if I could get you to, uh, to do so. I want you to ponder for one second. If you yourself personally were looking at the possibility of renal failure, how would you want that renal failure treated? And I want to see a show of hands. I want everyone to participate. I want everyone who would want their renal failure treated with dialysis for the rest of their life to raise their hand. I see no hands. Anyone hands? OK. Now, I want everyone who would want to be on dialysis for a period of months or years followed by a deceased donor transplant as their optimal choice to raise their hands. Again, I see one hand. OK. And then thirdly, a live donor kidney transplant performed preemptively prior to any dialysis. Raise your hand if that would be your preferred treatment. So I see most of the hands now. So I think my point is well made. Most of us who work in the field understand the advantages. Here we'll spend some, a half an hour or so talking about uh, live donation, the evaluation, the risks, the benefits, et cetera. So let's start with the case, a 32-year-old woman presents for advice regarding her chronic kidney disease. She has biopsy-proven IgA nephropathy. Uh, she has a creatinine of about 3.5, GFR below 20. She has some symptoms that are consistent with uremia. She's a, a professional, married, would like to have children, works a, as an attorney. Uh, there's some coronary disease in the family. She's hypertensive, BMI is good. She has some red cells on her urine. So the question is, what method of treat renal failure should you recommend? And we've actually already really been through this with our, with our uh, 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 show of hands in the audience. I think most of us would agree that a preemptive live donor kidney transplant would be preferred for this individual. So let's go to some background now and talk about transplant and put live donor kidney transplantation in the context of the treatment of renal failure in general. Uh, I don't consider myself very old, but even during my training, it seemed like a balance as to whether someone should dialyze or have a transplant. Um, that was in the 90s. Um, but this paper in 1999 in the New England Journal uh, uh, really blew away this, uh, this notion um, by doing something very clever, and that was comparing patients on the waiting list to patients who actually got transplanted. Prior to that, all comparisons of dialysis and transplant had been confounded by the fact that transplant patients were healthier. And so most people challenged, or some people challenged the outcomes with transplant by saying, Patients do better because they're healthier. But this, patient's, uh, this paper made an apples-to-apples -apples comparison and found a relative risk of death at 18 months of 0.32, a really uh, extraordinarily uh, dramatic uh, treatment effect for transplant relative to staying on dialysis. That was a survival benefit. There have been, there's a huge literature on the quality of life benefits after renal transplantation. Anyone who meets transplant patients and, and no, meets dialysis patients compares their lives, knows this without looking at a lot of data. Uh, but here's uh, it's five dimensions across the x-axis and, uh, and uh, histogram showing uh, progress towards the general population in patients after transplantation compared to patients who are awaiting transplant. Cognitive function is another very important issue um, uh, and another important improvement that occurs in transplant patients. The first case I showed you was an attorney working in the tech sector. Uh, to uh, function at that level, uh, you need to have uh, your gray matter functioning as optimally as possible. Transplant helps you with that. I think uh, uh, this slide is meant to uh, show how transplant has gotten better over the years. Um, in green, the one-year survival. In yellow, the uh, rejection rates. Other than the introduction of cyclosporin in 1984, which has uh, uh, resulted in really dramatic uh, inflection uh, points uh, in improvement, the, many of the other improvements that have occurred in transplant over that period of time have been incremental. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's still some uncertainty or some uh, unawareness about the benefits of transplant. It's been a cumulative effect. It's been immunosuppression improvements. It's been surgical technique improvements. It's been better teamwork. It's a huge number of things that have resulted in, a, in such a dramatic improvement in kidney transplant survival. Unfortunately, over this period of time, the number of kidney transplants performed has plateaued. Uh, this is uh, over uh, a, a significant period of time. And you can see that live donor and 
deceased donor transplants have plateaued. In fact, live donor have fallen a little bit uh, since their peak. And so uh, the number of patients simultaneously have increased on the waiting list. This is uh, the active and the inactive waiting lists. Um, new patients added and the patients waiting on the list. And thus, the median years to kidney transplant have increased, as we all recognize. Um, in all types of kidneys, patients are waiting longer for deceased donor kidney transplants. So the solution or potential solution to this, waiting for the deceased donor, is a live donor kidney, of course. What are some of the advantages? We'll go into some of these in more detail later in the talk, but certainly there's shorter or no waiting time. There's the possibility of the preemptive kidney transplant. It's a scheduled procedure when the recipient health has been optimized. There's a lower risk of delayed graft function, a lower risk of rejection. These kidneys work better and generally for longer. The half-life, a conservative estimate of the half-life might be 12 to 14 years for live donor versus 10 to 11 for deceased. And possibly this translates into better patient survival, particularly in the younger age group recipients. Here's some data from Ulfmeyer Kreisch uh, demonstrating uh, graft survival in, in a very large cohort of recipients of deceased donor kidney transplant compared to where they were, how many months or years of dialysis they'd, uh, they'd had prior to transplant, and comparing them to the preemptive uh, group in the top. And you can see that there's a pretty obvious advantage to preemptive kidney transplantation in terms of survival. And with each successive six-month increment in dialysis sur uh, time, survival falls. Here's another way of looking at it. This is, an, this is from the uh, USRDS, annual mortality rates for patients on the waiting list from the time of placement. And you can see in the top bars, patients with uh, five years, then the middle bar is two to five, and then less than two years. I think it's notable that, uh, let me see if I can point here, that uh, dialysis uh, mortality has fallen. Uh, we're paying more attention to KT over V. All sorts of interventions have improved uh, dialysis outcomes. And yet, despite those declines over the last decade plus, there's still a rather dramatic increase or, uh, in the uh, uh, mortality of patients who've been on for more than five years relative to two to five, relative to less than two. Hence the rationale for uh, the preemptive kidney transplant for our hypothetical attorney um, working in the tech sector. Uh, this is some data demonstrating the half-life of living versus deceased donor kidneys. And you can see that uh, in the purple lines that living donor kidneys last longer than deceased donor kidneys. Unfortunately, though, most of us in the room raised our hand and stated that we would prefer as our treatment for kidney failure a preemptive live donor kidney transplant. The rates of those transplants are low in the United States and have not improved over a decade in 2000 or more. In 2003, 93,000 patients underwent hemodialysis as their initial treatment for renal failure compared to only 2,000 who received a kidney transplant as their initial therapy. In 2012, it was a very similar number, about just over 2.5% received preemptive kidney transplant as their initial therapy for, ki for renal failure. So we have a lot of progress to make if we want to embrace for our patients the therapy that we all would like for ourselves. In June 2014, there was a consensus conference sponsored by the American Society of Transplantation, 10 other organizations. There were six clinical rec recommendations made uh, to promote living kidney transplantation, expand education regarding it, three policy recommendations, including the recommendation that financial neutrality for donors be pursued uh, through a variety of experimental um, attempts to do so without uh, uh, creating ethical problems, and a series of research recommendations, including barriers uh, to, uh, or strategies to study uh, financial barriers and how they might be eliminated. There's the reference at the bottom of the slide if you're interested in more detail. So let's pause with that background and, and consider a second case of a 45-year-old man who presents to you for advice about donating a kidney to his 50-year-old brother, and specifically his post-donation risks of end-stage renal disease and the benefits to the brother. The brother has type 1 diabetes. He has no other medical, significant medical problems. Takes, uh, I'm sorry, the donor has no medical problems, takes no medications. There is a father with hypertension. His mother's alive and well. His blood pressure the day you see him is normal. 
as is his physical exam. And on a 24-hour urine collection, he has a creatinine clearance of 136 mils per minute per 1.73 meters square. Which of the following is true? A, he should avoid live donation, which is unsafe. A deceased donor kidney is adequate for a diabetic patient. That is his brother. B, he should definitely donate. There are no risks to live donation. C, live kidney donation comes with a small risk of perioperative mortality and a small increased risk of end-stage renal disease post-donation, risks that most donor candidates gladly accept. Or D, most live kidney donors regret their decision to donate, and therefore he should not donate. I would recommend C, terrific. I, I'm sorry if I'm supposed to pause and let people answer. Um, but yes, I agree with you. I heard some Cs. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's the single best answer by far, and we'll, we'll break that apart in the next few slides. So the, of course, the, start, the start or the, the, the story of successful kidney transplantation begins uh, with the Herrick twins across town at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in the uh, early to mid-1950s when uh, uh, one twin donated to his, uh, to his brother, resulted in a Nobel Prize in 1990. Uh, to Dr. Murray. Um, the part of that story that you may or may not be aware of is, is that uh, the donor, uh, Ronald Herrick, died uh, as a dialysis patient. So here's an obituary. I was not involved in his care. What I'm showing you is available in the, uh, in the media. Here's a, an obituary uh, from his death in 2010. Donated in 1954 at the age of 23, at the age of 71 in 2002, according to media reports, he began dialysis 48 years post-donation. He had bypass surgery, he had other medical issues, again, according to media reports, and then died at the age of 79, eight years later. Important to note that he, uh, throughout his life, expressed, even after he was on dialysis, again, according to media reports, expressed absolutely no regret, and in fact, was very pleased with his decision to donate to his brother all those decades before. So let's talk about the data uh, 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 that we have for live donation and the safety of it. Here's uh, an old paper. I show it on purpose as an old paper um, from 2002. Um, they studied a large group of donors who were out 20 to 37 years, so a long follow-up. Got mean creatinine of 1.2 in a young cohort, 1.3 in those who were, who were out more than 30 years. That's pretty good. Um, three that had been on end-stage renal disease and been on dialysis, three that had abnormal kidney function, two that had transplants, hypertension, rates of hypertension and proteinuria were similar to the general population. Uh, but of course, uh, like uh, you'll immediately grasp that there's some major problems with the methodology in this paper. 773 donors and data was obtained on only 464 of them. Um, 380 were alive, and only 256 of those returned questionnaires. So it begs a lot of questions about what happened to all the other individuals um, that uh, had donated who were lost to follow-up. This has been a major problem in our ability to advise donor candidates about the safety of the procedure. This is a paper that I, uh, that I uh, throw out. It's in the same category. It's an observational paper. It's interesting because they, they looked at uh, donors, uh, or not donors, but rather American servicemen who'd lost kidneys after traumatic injuries in World War II. And they studied them in the early 1990s, about 45 years after they'd lost a kidney. Um, so its advantage is 45 years of follow-up, which is longer than what we have for donor nephrectomies. Um, but the problems of the other trial, of the other study, remain. Uh, many people were lost to follow up, uh, or, or uh, data wasn't available, I should say. Um, there were some with abnormal renal function, but it was, there were, since there was no control group, it was impossible to say whether those rates were higher than would have been expected or lower. One thing we do know quite well is the risk of death short term. This is a paper from JAMA in 2010. And the, the, what I uh, reference, I uh, feel comfortable uh, describing to donor candidates is a rate of dying perioperatively of about three per 10,000. Um, this compares to uh, risk of death within 90 days among matched and Haynes controls of 0.4 per 10,000 and compares very favorably to the risk of death from other elective surgical procedures such as a laparoscopic cholecystectomy where actually the risk exceeds the risk of lap donor nephrectomy. Uh, surgical mortality hasn't increased despite the doubling in, uh, the, in older donors and higher BMI. I think that's a testament to our colleagues in surgery and anesthesia. Uh, 
It is important to note there are some subgroups highlighted here at the bottom who do have uh, uh, probably experience higher risk of perioperative mortality uh, than that uh, uh, composite 3.1 per 10,000. It's also important to be aware that GFR in donors falls uh, during uh, uh, our donor education uh, as required by uh, UNOS. We advise people they can expect anywhere from 20 to 35, 25 to 35 percent permanent reduction in GFR. Of course, on the moment of the donor nephrectomy, there's a 50 percent reduction, but the remaining kidney then compensates, partially compensates for that. One area that this comes up with increasing frequency is that patients now have access to their lab results uh, through their physician or by signing on to their hospital's portal. And what they notice is their GFR may be starred as abnormal or their creatinine may be starred as abnormal after, after donating a kidney. And this gets them very anxious. So it's very important to discuss to people in advance that those normals are normals for people with two kidneys and they were not op those normals are not appropriate for prior live donors, but it's equally important for them to understand that there is a permanent partial reduction in their GFR. Obviously, patients might get readmitted to the hospitals. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. There was some suggestion that readmission rates may be increasing over time, which may reflect older, older donor age. So let's now jump into the more modern age of donor risk assessment with a, by talking about a few papers that have been published in the last few years. Uh, addressing risk. Um, this is a paper uh, from Norway uh, that used uh, a, a carefully um, uh, devised comparison group uh, where they tried to identify individuals who were just as healthy as donors but in fact did not donate. And what they found was a risk of end-stage renal disease that was increased uh, relative risk um, to 11.38 among prior donors. Um, this was a paper published around the same time as this other paper that came from a group at Johns Hopkins. Um, and what these uh, uh, physicians estimated was a lifetime risk of ESRD of 90 per 10,000 in donors compared to 326 per 10,000 in uh, the general population. And here's the, here's the rub compared to 14 per 10,000 among healthy non-donors. So those are numbers I think that are worth remembering, uh, though we'll talk about another paper in a second to give you another uh, more ability to predict for people their risks of renal failure. But what I would conclude from this, what most have concluded from this, is that there is an increase in the risk of renal failure after donating, um, but the absolute risk is low. Um, and in fact, significantly below the general population. And that's what really distinguishes these papers from, from, from prior work. Prior work compared healthy donors to the general population, and of course, they're not the same. Donors have been very carefully screened, and their risk of renal failure, if they're that, as healthy enough to donate, but in fact don't donate, is going to be very different than the general population. And that's really what this paper, uh, what this paper showed. In uh, January of this year, uh, a, a, a large um, uh, group of investigators published uh, this interesting risk projecting projection for live kidney donor candidates, again in the New England Journal. Uh, they used data from uh, almost 5 million patients to estimate a 15-year risk of end-stage renal disease in the general population, and then uh, did some calculations to try and estimate the effects that donation would have on that. Um, what's very important to note is that they established uh, uh, clearly what uh, most nephrologists would recognize, and that, the, and that is that the lifetime risk of renal failure uh, varies considerably on the basis of ethnicity, race, and gender, um, and that other risk factors such as uh, GFR, low GFR to start, the presence of hypertension, albuminuria, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity all impact the rate of of uh, the lifelong risk of renal failure. 15 year observed risk after donation suggested a 3.5 to 5.3 times higher risk of renal failure as, uh, as a result of donating a kidney. And I think uh, this is an important uh, uh, example. Uh, first, I point out to you that these models exist online. If you're counseling a specific patient or you want to play around with the numbers yourself, I recommend this to you. 
But here, it's, let me take just a couple of examples. So here we have um, a young uh, African-American donor, only 20 years old, with an excellent GFR of 115, but a little bit of microalbumin and a blood pressure of 140 who's currently smoking. And the model predicts a, a, uh, uh, this risk of renal failure. Uh, and yet, if you look at a Caucasian donor who is uh, three times you know, uh, uh, older, uh, uh, at 60, never smoked, uh, without uh, uh, albuminuria, and the rate of the model-based lifetime projection renal failure is considerably lower. So the point is that uh, these estimates need to be tailored to the individual's pre-existing risk of renal failure. And of course, uh, this science can improve as we better understand what the risk factors are that result in renal failure, but this is the best as it currently exists. It's important when counseling uh, women of childbearing age uh, who are considering being donors uh, what their pregnancy outcomes might be after they donate. Um, here's a paper from uh, about little more than a year ago, again from the New England Journal, that confirmed uh, that gestational hypertension uh, and uh, preeclampsia were more common among live kidney donors than among non-donors but the outcomes are still excellent. There were no, in this series, no reports of maternal death, stillbirth, neonatal death among the donors, and the vast majority of women had uncomplicated pregnancies after live kidney donation. As a result of the two papers that I mentioned, the paper from Norway, the paper from Hopkins, the National Organ Procurement and Transportation Network uh, made a, uh, uh, issued a whole series of new guidelines. Um, and one of the things that's happened as a result of this is the requirement that transplant centers build in a significant amount of follow-up uh, for their patients uh, and follow patients at regular intervals in a much more detailed way so that we can fill in the evidence base and not have so many um, patients lost to follow up. One of the problems is that donors are difficult to follow because they feel very well. And you call them and ask them to submit a urinalysis or have blood drawn, and it's, it's hard to get them to leave their lives to do that. I think it's also very important to note that uh, patients who donate are generally very happy that they did so. This is a study from my colleagues across town at the BI Deaconess. 94 to 95 seven percent of donors that they surveyed reported quite a bit are being extremely satisfied with donating. Um, uh, 94 to 99 would make the same decision over again. Uh, Twenty percent, a significant minority, had more pain than they expected, and 28 percent had a decline in energy. This paper and just my own personal experiences have uh, just have changed what I advise donor candidates and in terms of how quickly they can expect to get back to their lives and feel normal. We get them out of the hospital in two days, um, but there's a substantial minority that's still experiencing pain, 30, 60, maybe even 90 days. Most of the pain is, it can be managed with Tylenol and they can go through their days, but if they know about it in advance, it's much less bothersome to them. Let's go on with a third case, a 69-year-old woman who presents for evaluation to be a kidney donor for her husband. She has hypothyroidism, uh, her blood pressure is 139 over 88 and a BMI of 29. Her blood group is A. Her husband, the intended recipient, is blood group B. She has a 24-hour urine creatinine clearance of 86 mils per minute per 1.73. The remainder of her workup is normal. What do you advise her? She cannot donate A due to a risk of perioperative fulminant hypothyroidism. B, she cannot donate as her risk of end-stage renal disease is too high due to low creatinine clearance. C, she cannot donate directly because she and her husband have incompatible blood groups, but she could donate through a paired exchange or a blood group incompatible transplant. Or D, she cannot donate as her BMI of 29 is too high. And I pause for a second and let anyone shout out any answer that they are interested in. C, C yes, I think that's correct. Uh, I agree with you. So let's talk about uh, uh, donor evaluation. Uh, the donor evaluation obviously should be focused on the donor risks. The risks are operative. The risks are living the rest of your life with only one kidney. There are psychosocial and financial risks of depression, body weight, image issues, lost wages, uninsurability, hopefully mitigated in the, in the uh, Affordable Care Act era. And then there's the risk of evaluation. That's something that donors often don't consider 
Uh, physicians know when you start doing CAT scans on people who don't have a particular indication or complaint, you sometimes find things in their adrenal glands or elsewhere that you wish you hadn't known about. And so that's an important issue for donors to be aware of. And in addition, their financial risks, they may uh, uh, be out of work, uh, they have to travel, et cetera. So how do we work up donors? Uh, this, I, I talk about, uh, there's a lot of ways to structure this. It's primarily a process, not a medical issue. So I'll tell you about the way we do it. Um, but keep in mind, uh, the, the other centers may do it differently. We bring donors in uh, for an initial session uh, where they learn a lot about donating a kidney and the risks and the benefits. They meet with a social worker, um, and then they meet with a nephrologist, um, uh, have a pretty focused uh, um, uh, discussion, a general discussion about their health history, but then um, a lot of evaluation that focuses on their risk of CKD and a pretty extensive family history is very important. They go to the lab and get uh, uh, chemistries, uh, CBC, a whole range of serologic tests, as you might imagine. Uh, they're required to keep their, their cancer screening uh, uh, or complete their cancer screening in an age and gender appropriate way, EKG and chest x-ray, and then a 24-hour urine uh, for creatinine clearance. There, this, is general, this is the standard in most places. Um, occasionally, centers will use a measured GFR. There's certainly nothing wrong with that, but uh, relative to doing a 24-hour urine, it's in most places a harder test to obtain and, and uh, a little bit less convenient. As needed, patients get stone screens, stress tests. Most centers are more aggressive in working up donors for cardiac risk uh, than they would be for someone undergoing elective surgery. We require stress tests in people over the age of 55. You can think of this as, uh, in some ways, what I tell patients, it's a little bit like an executive physical. Uh, now sort of a debunked idea for, for executives, but nonetheless, uh, when you're talking about performing surgery on someone on behalf of someone else, uh, we do everything we can to try and establish the safety. After the first evaluation is complete and the labs are reviewed and it appears the patient is a candidate to be a donor, we bring them back for a second uh, a visit. And the first part of that second visit is the CT scan to look at their anatomy. That includes, obviously, radiation, and it also includes IV contrast. Our hospital has a, a protocol that's specifically low-dose radiation and low-dose contrast, but obviously there are risks with both of those, and that's why we put this CT scan off as late as possible so that we're not exposing the donor to any risk if, in fact, they may turn out not to be a candidate for another reason. They meet with a living donor advocate. This is a required position at transplant centers. This individual is often a social worker, as it is in our program, and they're meant to be uh, explained to the person all their rights um, and make sure that they, that they are donating um, of uh, uh, free will and to make sure they understand that they can back out at any time, et cetera. It's very important that that advocate be independent of the recipient. That, that person can't be involved by, by uh, regulation, cannot be involved in the evaluation of recipients at that hospital. Some patients see the psychiatrist, the dietitian, et cetera, and then lastly, a visit with the surgeon who can describe the, uh, the surgery to them uh, and review their CAT scan with them and see if there are any anatomic issues. I won't go through these uh, exclusions in uh, detail. Uh, they're in your packet, uh, but uh, they uh, are all, the reasons for them are all um, pretty accurate, or are pretty obvious, and I would note that these are part of the OPTN policy. So these are not Mass General Hospital's exclusion criteria. These are criteria that, that all uh, transplant centers need to live by. So let's talk a little bit about GFR. In that last case, we had a patient with a GFR in the uh, 80s at the age of 69. Uh, donors certainly need adequate kidney function for themselves to survive after donor nephrectomy, but obviously they also need to have adequate kidney function so that the one kidney given to the recipient will be adequate for the recipient. So as I mentioned, most centers use a 24-hour cutting clearance, and most centers also use a cutoff of about 80 mil per minute per 1.73 on a reasonable collection. It's been the suggestion in the literature, which I think is reasonable, uh, to, uh, to adjust that 80, which is somewhat arbitrary, uh, on the basis of age and allow slightly lower thresholds uh, uh, on the basis of uh, patients with higher age. I think it's also certainly reasonable, there's not a lot of literature on this, to expect or to require higher thresholds for younger patients. So a young person with a GFR of 86 might, uh, in most centers, I think, not be uh, acceptable or at least would be questioned, whereas a 69 or 72-year-old with, with a creatinine clearance of 86 probably would be acceptable in most centers.
As I mentioned, Measure GFR can be used. We reserve it for ambiguous cases and, and older donors where we, we really want to be sure. So let's now take another case. I didn't uh, highlight this with another case number, but I think it's number four. Which individual would be accepted at most centers to donate a kidney? A, a 22-year-old brother of a patient with IgA nephropathy who has microscopic hematuria. B, an 18-year-old with a 24-hour creatinine clearance of 85 mils per minute per 1.73 meters square. C, a 50-year-old who feels her brother's wife is pushing her to donate. Uh, that's a red flag there. And then D, a 55-year-old on amlodipine, 5 milligrams QD for, fifth, for a 15-year history of hypertension. Let me block the light and see any, any ideas. I guess it's not a show of hands. D, yeah, D, exactly right. Um, the first one would be a great, would be greatly concerned about the risks of, uh, about that patient's risk. Um, talk about how that might be handled in a minute. Um, as I've already mentioned, the young donor with a marginal creatinine clearance is, uh, is not acceptable in most places. Uh, coercion is obviously uh, not acceptable. So then we have this patient with essential hypertension, it seems. The blood pressure is reasonable on one single drug. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, again, there's a little bit of variability from, uh, from uh, around the country, um, but uh, most centers will transplant patients who are over the age of 50 who are on one agent, possibly two agents, if not maximally dosed, well-controlled blood pressure, Caucasian, and this is an important point, no end organ damage, um, meaning normal EKG, normal echo, eye grounds, et cetera. This is the kind of uh, time when you want to use that uh, website that I showed earlier and estimate that particular donor's risk uh, for end-stage renal disease eventually, uh, or uh, lifelong risk of end-stage renal disease. Then we have the issue of overweight. Again, not a lot of uh, uh, data. Most centers will exclude patients greater than 35 and accept people up to a threshold of about 30 to 32. Um, that is a number that's increasing, and there's, uh, there is a wide variation across the country in that number. And one of the things that's interesting about the paper from the New England Journal this last January about lifelong risks of renal failure, uh, and you can see this in those calculators if you go play with them, is overweight was a relatively small contributor, for example, compared to smoking, uh, which turned out to be quite a dramatic uh, increase, a significant relative risk. So I think that's a number with a lot of um, uh, variability and, and one with some uh, judgment or art to it. Diabetics get excluded, obviously. There's the question of patients with so-called prediabetes or just history of gestational diabetes. We often do additional workup on those patients, may even refer them to an endocrinologist. Those, those uh, cases are taken on a case-by-case -case basis with a lot of additional uh, informed consent for the donor about their risks of diabetes and, and, the, and the association between diabetes and renal failure. And that last case, we had this young man who had a brother with IgA nephropathy and then some microscopic hematuria. Uh, I think it's easy to walk away from those donors and tell them they're not candidates. Certainly that one would be, it would be concerning that that individual actually has IgA nephropathy themselves. But depending on the situation, some centers will also proceed with a more dramatic workup of such a donor. If the ethics are compelling enough for this donor and the, desire, the donor uh, really wants to proceed, uh, some centers will on occasionally, in addition to working up the, uro the, uh, the bladder and the, and the whole uh, uh, urologic workup for microhematuria, they might even proceed to renal biopsy to prove that there is or is not IgA nephropathy. Albuminuria uh, in uh, uh, extents or significant albuminuria is obviously an exclusion. Mild, uh, smaller amounts of albuminuria need to be put in the context of the patient's overall risk of renal failure. Kidney stones are very common, of course. We let people proceed if they have a unilateral stone, they have no metabolic abnormalities on their 24-hour urines, they haven't had recurrent stones, and they don't have struvite or cysteine stones. Uh, patients with a family history of polycystic kidney disease, uh, they all need imaging if they're over 30. If they're less than 30, it's important to know that the imaging the false negative rate is inadequate, um, at least in the traditional um, imaging with ultrasound. Whether MR would change that, we're not really sure. But us, uh, our center and most centers recommend genetic testing uh, in, in individuals less than 30 with a family history of polycystic kidney disease and primary relatives who wish to be donors. And we have this issue of African-American donors with a family history of end-stage renal disease. 
There's been a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, research on whether APO, APO, APO1 one testing should be performed in donor candidates. Our center's not doing it as a routine. Most centers are not. The gene frequency of this gene is extraordinarily high. Uh, transplantation, live donor transplantation is less common in the African American community anyway. And the concern, of course, is that we may be excluding people who would be uh, adequate donors on the basis of the results of a test we don't fully understand. Um, stay tuned on this one. As you tell from the calculator, obviously, as we all know, the risk of renal failure in African Americans is, is significantly higher than the general population. And, and this is an issue that really uh, causes us you know, who work in transplant and donation to lose sleep. I think it's important to understand and to put all of this uh, uh, in the context of uh, the harm of refusing donors. Uh, that's a sort of a novel idea. I recommend this paper uh, reference there from the American Journal of Transplantation from a couple years ago. The suffering from end-stage renal disease is so strong that it doesn't spare family. Family and friends suffer when someone is on dialysis. Um, of course, the uh, annual mortality for a patient who is on dialysis and waiting for a kidney transplant is not insubstantial at about 7% per year. Most transplant programs, uh, UNOS guidelines, certainly physicians by their training tend to emphasize non-maleficence, meaning do no harm. Why let someone donate a kidney? We might hurt them. Um, but donors who are declined, who are told they cannot donate, lose something as well. They lose autonomy. Obviously, they've lost the opportunity to help someone that they know or someone that they love. Uh, and so a decision to refuse a donor uh, is a decision to take something away from them in terms of their ability to determine their own life path. Now, a few who work in transplantation would say that donor candidates have a right to donate, that they can demand to donate a kidney. We do hear that from time to time. People say, I'm willing to take any risk. Why don't you just take out my kidney? But obviously, this is a profession, and we don't just do what people tell us to do. I think this article sums, summarizes by saying the risks and benefits of donation are better framed as how do the risks and benefits of donation compare with the risks and benefits of not donating for this individual and this potential recipient. So to summarize the talk, live donation surgery is safe, but it's not perfect. Three in 10,000 risk of dying from the surgery. Living the rest of your life with one kidney is also safe, but is associated with an increased risk of end-stage renal disease. The relative risks are significant, but the absolute risks remain very low and substantially lower than the general population. The lifelong risk of end-stage renal disease in young donors is particularly difficult to ask, estimate. Risks may be increased in the relatives of recipients. I didn't mention that earlier, but the Norwegian study found that most of the donors who developed ESRD were related to the recipients. A little bit hard in the statistics to sort out whether that was a true effect, um, but that's something to keep in mind. Donor physicians or any physician who sees a donor candidate must seek to balance non-maleficence with donor autonomy when considering whether to approve or decline a donor. Live kidney donation surgery offers many advantages relative to deceased donor transplant. There's a national consensus that live kidney donation should expand. Donor education evaluation must address all the risks. And most donors are very glad they donated and would say and would gladly sign up to donate again. Here are some references. Thank you very much for your attention. One question, I guess. Please. So, uh, actually, I'll um, combine the questions. What about ABPM in young donors uh, regularly doing things? Since office blood pressures are not very inclusive, uh, you know, and who's paying for all this? Event? Yeah. So uh, the the second question is easy. The recipient's insurance pays for it, uh, with certain exceptions, of course. They don't pay for travel for the most part, uh, and they don't pay for lost wages, um, etc. I believe it was United Healthcare actually just this year announced that they would pay for those expenses up to about $5,000 for donors um, on behalf of United insured recipients. I think that's exciting. I think there's a lot of, uh, I think you'll see some movement in the next few years um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, keep, at least getting donors whole. If not, uh, obviously no one wants, uh, well, not no one, but there's a lot of controversy about uh, anything that would be considered valuable consideration for a donor. But I think there's, there's growing consensus that donors should not at least be out of pocket for their travel in their hotel, for example. Now, as far as blood pressure, uh, most uh, centers accept uh, several uh, office blood pressures measured um, uh, 
you know, if they're normal. Um, obviously, in family history of hypertension, a blood pressure that's a little bit off, even on one occasion, absolutely gets responded to with, with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and the exclusion if it's, uh, if it's abnormal. Good questions, thank you.